Good evening. I'm Wally Mason. I'm the director of the museum. Uh, I couldn't be more thrilled tonight. There's just, it's great to see so many people here. It's great to see so many students. There's a great show up. We have two of the driving forces of California photography with us tonight. And we have Toby, too. Uh, so my, my goal tonight is simply to introduce Toby Jurevex, who is the chief curator at Jocelyn. And he's someone that if I want to know anything about photography, I call him. If I want to know anything about the West, I call him. If I want to know a good bar, I call Toby. <laughs> he's, he's a man of many talents. Uh, he has written incredible uh, entries in books. He's curated over 60 exhibi exhibitions. Uh, he's worked at the Smithsonian. He's worked at Princeton Art Museum. And I'm thrilled to hand Toby the mic, and we'll get started. Thanks. I think I'm good. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, is that it? Thank you, Wally. I think, why don't we all come up? Uh, anything about photography in the 1870s or 1970s west of the 100th Meridian? Or a bar? Thank you uh, for having me here this evening, Wally, and for the, Sheldon for having me out. And it is uh, great to be here with John, who I've known for a bit, and Anthony, who I've met about an hour ago. Um, I'll just briefly introduce them. Uh, Anthony Hernandez was born in 1947 in Aliso Village in East Los Angeles. And the um, Guggenheim website notes, while Hernandez was a senior at Roosevelt High School, a friend gave him a photography textbook that had been left in a bathroom, which is likely a, a more auspicious start than many of your colleagues have had in this field. And aren't you thankful it was a photography book? <laughs> right. <laughs> After taking a few basic photography classes at East Los Angeles College in the 1960s, he began to work in black and white, um, primarily as a street photographer. His practice soon expanded to include color photographs against the backdrop of Los Angeles, as well as stints in Rome, London, Saigon, and Las Vegas. He's exhibited widely across the United States and Europe and received three fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. He is also a 2018 John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellow. In 2016, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art organized a retrospective of his 45-year titled, career titled, aptly enough, Anthony Hernandez. He divides his time between Los Angeles and Chalice, Idaho. And to my further left is John Davola, also born in, 19, or born in 1949, also in Los Angeles. He received a BA from California State Uni University, Northridge, in 1971 and an MA and MFA from UCLA in 1973 and 1974, respectively. Since 1988, John has been professor of art at the University of California, Riverside. His work has been featured in more than 70 solo exhibitions across the United States and in Europe, Japan, Mexico, and Australia, as well as an exhibition uh, this spring at Jocelyn Art Museum's Riley Cap Gallery, um, about which one visitor commented, and this is a quote, I just had a quite visceral experience when I turned the corner into the Cap Gallery and beheld Dark Star B. It's goddamn terrifying. <laughs> Thank you for that. Hmm. He's received four individual artist fellowships from the NEA and a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship in 1986. John is the subject of a dozen monographs, including isolated houses, from which there are selections in the upper galleries. As far as I could get, the catalog from his 2013 retrospective organized by the LA County Museum of Art and the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and most recently, Vandalism, a compendium of his early altered images. On his biography, the Riverside page, it says, while he has approached a broad range of subjects, he is currently moving through the landscape looking for the oscillating edge between the abstract and the specific. So perhaps we will find out exactly where that is. See what I can do. Uh, see what, <laughs> well, we have, um, I was thinking the, the introduction to the exhibition says, approaching landscape considers how artists depict natural, built, and imaginary environments as ways to explore the complex relationships humans have with the places they choose to inhabit. And um, one of the things I was thinking is that we have certainly the built and imaginary environments in your work, not too much 
one could argue, of the, um, of the natural world. Um, and in particular, well, I think when we traditionally think of landscape, we think of this idea of wilderness. Um, both of your work, I think, completely dispenses with this idea of a kind of romantic uh, horizon. Mm -hmm. Is that a question? It was a question. It was a, it was a <laughs> statement leading to a question. Agree or disagree, John? Uh, agree or disagree. Uh, that presupposes that I'm thinking of myself as a landscape photographer. You're not. You're not. No. Uh, actually, when people ask me, what, you know, sometimes when we ask you what you do, and uh, I often say, I'm a photographer because it requires less explanation than saying you're an artist, because there's always a follow-up question. And then the follow-up question when you say you're a photographer is what kind of photography do you do? You, you often just say landscape, because that's the one that requires the least explanation in a certain sense. But I mean, I'm, I make, I've made work that is about the landscape specifically, but very few bodies of work I did a piece called Four Landscapes that was literally about the idea of landscape and maybe the isolated houses are close to landscape. But mainly I'm trying to find a, a, a process or an activity and so I go into the landscape and I find an opportunity to kind of interact and engage and I bring back these artifacts from that engagement and that's, that's my work. And, uh, and there's certain kinds of environments that offer me greater potential to generate the kinds of images that interest me than others. And it's, not, it's usually not the pure natural landscape. Uh, so I don't know if that, if so, I've, I've talked so long I've forgotten your question, but that's, <laughs> I'll let Tony. Well, um, somebody asked me the same thing. What, uh, who, what do you do as an artist? And I, I do say I'm an artist. And, Say, uh, then when they find out a, a photographer, I say, what's your subject? And I always say, it's easy for me. I, I, I just say L.A. L.A. is my subject. It has been for a long time. And that kind of stops them because they're trying to figure out L.A. You know? But landscape, um, my first idea of landscape were um, Landscapes of the Homeless, which I did in the 80s. And the title, Landscapes of the Homeless, is my gesture, my gift, so you might say, for those people in living in those conditions in LA. And to me, that was landscapes about something. And so, but after that, even now, the pictures that we're seeing here um, in the desert are just, it's like going out to a desert that you don't, you don't know, you, you haven't been out there before, and you go out there and, to see what's there. And in that discovery, you're really, really always um, incredibly surprised. And then to make a picture in that moment, at that time, that's an incredible kind of experience. And that's what my picture of this, particularly called Discarded, are all those experiences of just finding something and photographing it at that moment. Which, you, you know, if you come back, the lights change, you can't photograph that again. That's just what it is at the moment. So I like that very much uh, immediacy of that kind of discovery. When um, we were speaking on the phone the other day and you mentioned that uh, you kind of go back and forth between Los Angeles and Idaho and you'd spend all of this time driving through Nevada and it had never occurred to you that you could make a, right. could make a photograph there. Right. And, um, um, I guess the first question would be why not, and then what changed? Well, it's because if, if you think about it, I mean, for me, um, Nevada is a big state, and you drive through it, and we drive through it a lot. But in, over the years, but to try to see in that huge space uh, potential for pictures, um, I never saw it. I mean, I thought it was um, well. Let's put it this way. People have been making pictures of mountains and these scenes and a lot, a lot of different people in, in the history. But to me, I wanted a different kind of, uh, if I can use the word, something that was more intimate, more close. And I didn't find, I mean, I couldn't mm -hmm. find it. I'm, at, I'm finding it now, after all these years. I finally figured out how to embrace that kind of space 
and that kind of experience, but it's taken a long time for me to finally start. You know. But you actually have to uh, go through that landscape, and, and that means just driving through it, and finally now it's falling in place. Is it sort of feel like there's, there's the place you're standing and there's the horizon and it's hard to kind of differentiate what, what's happening in that middle ground? Yes, and, and I think, you know, that um, there's that whole um, question of uh, East Coast and um, West Coast. Uh, the East Coast is about place and the West Coast is about space, you know. So that's, I think, what I'm trying to deal with is how do you make pictures in this huge space? Intimate pictures, so to speak. And John, when, are, were, the, um, were the vandalism photographs, were those the, kind of the first major body of work that you exhibited? Uh, no, I, when I was in college, actually the vandalism body of work was my MFA thesis. So, uh, but the MA, I got an MA and an MFA. The MA, I actually was doing 35 millimeter uh, social landscape photographs, women watering lawns and like things in the San Fernando Valley. So mm -hmm. because I studied photography and, and it's, it's hard for people to remember how separate those kinds of the, the world of the narrative of the evolution of photography and photo history was from art mm -hmm. at that point in time. And social landscape was kind of the primary mode. Uh, although I was, uh, had gone to UCLA as one, for one year as an undergraduate and there was a lot of kind of photo print making which I just couldn't make sense of. I couldn't figure out why I would use one iconography over another. So I just started photographing in the neighborhood where I lived because I thought, well, at least I'll have that connection. These were the, the pictures you made walking around in the, in the valley? Yeah, or riding my bicycle primarily around in the valley and ended up being mostly women watering lawns. And, <laughs> uh, and then I, so I, I no, normally it was like a three year program and normally nobody bothered to get an MA. They just went for three years and got MFA. But I sort of finished that work after two years, and then I had to figure out something else to do, and I ended up doing those vandalism photographs where I sort of painted in abandoned houses. And I used vandalism, I used that term because I thought I was vandalizing a tradition in photography. I thought I'd like to intervene in, you know, we used to in class argue about whether it was okay to move a candy wrapper out of a photograph, or, you know, you used to like file out your negative carrier to prove that you printed the entire negative. There, there was this, this desire for a kind of authenticity that uh, right. didn't make any sense to me anymore. So, uh, but that, that just sounds silly now. But uh, Now that certainly wasn't coming from Heineken at that point. Uh, it prob well, it wasn't coming from, that's a complicated question. Heineken, uh, Heineken, Robert Heineken's the person I, sort of my mentor in graduate school. And he was a proponent. He was uh, he was interested in this. Okay, again, it's a complicated question. He made art out of the kind of envelope of representations that one found oneself in. So he he made art out of magazine pages, and he made art off of uh, putting Cibrochrome on the the television monitor and making exposure. So he's a very early in that sense, postmodernist, in that he sort of sees uh, your experience of the world is not simply the direct experience of the, of the three-dimensional universe you work in, but this mediated flood of images that you find yourself within. And he made work out of that. Uh, but he sort of made it in a very modernist way, that he made it out about his own personal desires rather than you know, the most the classic postmodernist thing of looking at the conditions of reception of, of the viewer looking at the work and trying to uh, show, you know, make explicit their implicit kind of ideologies that they bring to interpreting. So I'm in that environment and I'm seeing Heineken and other people working in that way and I'm looking at art magazines, right? And I'm seeing photographs of performance, photographs of earthworks. So it becomes natural for me to see photography as this collator of this kind of discourse within the broader arts. So if you look at those vandalism things, they're, they're kind of about performance and, and abstraction and painting. So it is kind of related to what Heineken was doing. I don't know that, it, had I not been in that environment, I'm not sure I would have like thought to make that work. And Anthony, what, 
you didn't go to a... No, I didn't, yeah, I was self-taught, so it's a... Um, I was kind of outside when I, I did meet Heineken um, when I was in L.A., but when I started, I didn't know who Heineken was. I didn't even know that UCLA had a program. I was completely out of it. So when I met him later, and, and, and I met other people, including Louis Balls and other people, everybody went to school. I didn't go to school. So in that, say, in that sense, I was always an outsider from that kind of world. And um, though I'd met everybody, it was just, uh, you know, I wasn't connected that way. I was only connected from my first photographic hero, which was Edward Weston, and that led me into photography, you know, and that was purely um, an accident, so to speak, you know. So I didn't go to school and I didn't, didn't have any experience of, um, of art or photography or literature at all, and photography was kind of a, a, a real moment to um, give me a direction, actually, because I had no idea of what I wanted to do when I was growing up. I kind of had a, some rough moments growing up, so photography was great. Um, just to go back from you both, I, and I'm sorry I had forgotten about that uh, that work in the um, in the valley. But you both had this start in as street photographers, right. and um, you know I think that most sort of default is to think about that as a very kind of New York centered or East Coast black um, and white, thirty five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, for me it wasn't. Um, I was pretty ignorant about the history of photography, everything about it. So to me, uh, my first experience of photography was 35 millimeter black and white street photographs. But it's because I grew up in downtown LA and I, when I wanted to start to make pictures, it was a place I knew. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really New York photography in, in that broad sense. It was like, this was my neighborhood, so to speak. Um, so I wanted to start making pictures there, and that's how it started. But obviously later, when I knew more about it and met people like Gary Winograd and Lee Freelander and all that, it all fell in place. And I did make a lot of pictures, um, the street photographs in downtown LA, but they were, um, the way I looked at it, compared to a lot of people, Gary, not just Gary, but Carter Bresson, a lot of the, Street, photo street photographers, I was really looking at my own town, LA downtown where I grew up, hung out as a kid, as looking at it in a really hard way. And those pictures are some hard pictures. And that's, I think, very different than if you start looking at um, a lot of other, even, even Robert Frank, who, who was really kind of a romantic and a poet. So I wouldn't say my photographs are that way at all. So did you, you, you um, in this work, I mean, you were, you were picturing a kind of economic stratification that you saw in, in Los Angeles. You were conscious of that. Yeah, well, thinking about the city as a very hard place, hard mm -hmm. surfaces, hard light, black and white, 35 millimeter. Um, I wanted to stay away from really wide angle lenses. So I always wanted to s look at things through st straight on. So it was a really kind of a sp specific kind of picture. And I only, only wanted to make those kinds of pictures. And I only actually, um, in terms of people like Gary Winogrand who took his camera everywhere, I only took my camera when I was going to work. So I didn't have my camera around my neck 24 hours a day. You know? So that was a thing that was a very um, specific kind of moment. And uh, I always think of it as a, uh, that was my first gesture of saying that that's what I wanted to try to, to deal with in that space of downtown LA, which I knew as a kid, you know, going to theater and hanging out. So it was very specific. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, at, uh, in that period in the, in the 60s and the 1970s, it seems like, uh, depending on which history you read, that all of photography emanated from that very small space of John Sarkowski's office at the Museum of Modern Art. Right. And that, um, you were, you know, if you weren't from New York, you were going to make the pilgrimage there with your box of prints or drop the portfolio off. Um, do you, how do you, you know, what, what's the difference with being a, a Los Angeles photographer? Well, I thought about New York uh, when I was out of the Army, um, and I thought, 
But I thought there are a lot of people in New York photographing, so I might as well just photograph in LA. That was another reason. But um, I did meet Sukowski that way. I did bring a box of pictures, mm -hmm. and he did buy a couple of them, you know. But um, uh, that was a different world, and, and I, I mean, it was a good world in a sense. Back then, photography was quite uh, simple, easy. Now, it's completely different. Uh, and there is a world now of photography. It wasn't then, in terms of galleries, museums, collections, all that stuff. But uh, I think um, Tchaikovsky's was a very specific and very narrow uh, place, and, um, and that's over now. Well, I mean, in one in one sense, that I mean, you know, there was a context a context of academia, certainly, and and actually, if you look at art in Los Angeles in the '60s and '70s, I, I remember for years looking at Art Forum, and it just every review of Los Angeles show was negative, because it was really seen as an, a provincial kind of outpost, and that that happened until like the 1980s, but. In some sense, it was kind of liberating, uh, and here I'm talking more about art in general, which is so that you know the discourse about art didn't really so much take place in museums and galleries. It took place in a few schools: Cal Arts, UCLA, USC, and uh, and so forth. And you know, it's it seems like if you were in New York and you were an artist, like you worked in a, in a white cube, a, a, a studio, and you knew your work was gonna go into some other white cube. And there were a lot of people in Los Angeles kind of working in ways where they weren't making those assumptions, that they weren't working in white cubes, making work to go to other white cubes. And so there's a kind of dynamic nature of a lot of artwork which embraced photography because the people were out in the world and they're making videos or they're doing performances or so there was it was a really so even though I came from a, a, a fairly narrow like when I was an under, undergraduate I studied photography and that was very informed by Sarkowski because he published he did the, the shows and like you know you have a Walker Evans show everybody in the United States knows who Walker Evans is and he becomes, becomes incredibly important by virtue of having that show yeah. at the Modern and, and a few other people. So he, he created the narrative within photography, but there's all this other stuff going on in LA which is broadening out that. And we had our own tradition of photography with Ansel Adams and Edward Weston and Imogen mm -hmm. Cunningham and all that stuff, although it was, we, in LA we always thought it was up in San Francisco because we were kind of isolated. Uh, and, but it was, a, it was a unique context in, in which for something hybridic to take place. You know. funny. I was thinking about that, um, that difference between LA and, and San Francisco. And San Francisco seemed to be very much sort of centered around the Friends of Photography and Carmel yeah. Valley and you know, Ansel and Morley Bauer. And there was this almost sort of reverential, um, well, both kind of love for uh, what they considered to be landscape, which had you know no people in it, no cars, mm -hmm. no nothing, um, eight by ten prints, um, and uh, it seems like LA was just completely. I don't know if it was um, how did kind of how did you look at that that uh, dialogue? Was it bemused or just seeing that as being a very kind of narrow approach to things? Well, I, I was really quite surprised because um, I did meet Ansel Adams and I received the first Ferguson Award, which they gave out in 1972. Uh, to me, a 35 millimeter black and white street photographer from LA, even though it was based in San Francisco, I mean, Carmel, you know, and uh, I was really surprised that I got that first Ferguson grant, you know. Um, but yes, all those people up there were interested in just straight, pure um, landscape kind of work, and it, I, I didn't care for, for, for that, but I was happy that I got that award, you know, and, <laughs> and, met, and met Ansel Adams, you know. Um, yeah, so it was kind of an awful. I was a photo nerd and I liked all that stuff. I yeah. mean, you know, they also had Dorothea Lange. I mean, oh, yeah. she was John great. Gutman. I mean, they had some like pretty damn interesting, less pictorial people working up there as well. Um, 
no, I always love that stuff, and I, I used to drive up to San Francisco just to get a fix mm -hmm. on that stuff. And and I'm I'm still still a photo nerd. I mean, even though I work in different kinds of ways, I, I still value the, a lot of the the characteristics of some of that work. And and yeah, a lot of those trajectories are kind of played out in some sense. But uh, the other uh, thing about San Francisco and L.A. is that. I went up to San Francisco and tried to photograph there. It didn't work for me. I thought it was just too beautiful, so to speak, the <laughs> setting, you know. And LA was like, that was where I was working. And so that was a difference. Otherwise, I, I couldn't see myself ever moving to, back then, I mean, early 70s, moving to San Francisco to photograph there. I just did, couldn't do it. I didn't, I didn't see anything there, so to speak, you know. That's how I, I don't know how you felt trying to. It never occurred to me to go to San Francisco and photograph. <laughs> right. or, or, well, the same thing with New York. It's like in the 80s, if you were a serious artist, you were supposed to move to New York because there was really nothing going on in Los Angeles. But as a photographer, it's used up, right? right. It's like that, that it's right. not that it's uninteresting, but it's just been right. mined to the, and it's, it's also much more controlled. I, the thing about Los Angeles is that it's so random. It's like, Somebody builds like a giant pink building next to a, a modernist building next to something else. There's absolutely no no control, and there's a sudden kind of a, a physical cacophony. Of, you know, trees from every different part of the world just plopped next to some other right, tree. Right. And so, if you're if you're interested in in discovering things you haven't seen before, it's a pretty rich. Not to mention the light's beautiful. Now, so. Yeah, and the thing about um, uh, San Francisco and New York, uh, I mean, going over, starting from the uh, mid 70s later, uh, I never bumped into a photographer except for Gary Winogrand later, whether it was downtown LA or Venice or Beverly Hills, whatever. In New York, you'd go to, I'd go to New York and <laughs> there's all yeah. of photographers on the streets. Everybody's on the street photographing. So it was like, you could see that. And it was like, oh, that was like forever, it was over. You know, and and and, I, and for me, I stopped photographing in 1976 of uh, 75 of 75, 76, 35 millimeter street photographs. That's when I stopped people. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, because I realized I had to do something else. Well, when I when I was um, I think I was about 10, we moved into a house in the valley. It was one of the early. Uh, subdivisions. The house was built in 1953, and I couldn't imagine that something that old actually existed. <laughs> right. And um, you know, do you? How do you kind of? L.A. You know, California doesn't have history in the in the in the same way. I remember moving to the East Coast, and they were talking about the 1700s. Right? What was that? Right. Uh, I mean, do you do you think that that kind of? How does that affect the way you're kind of looking at? or uh, how does it affect your work that way? Well, I think it's the, the freedom of LA is like, a, 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 you know, just a big, I, mean, I always think of it as my big studio, but uh, in New York, it, it's, um, it, it, it has that history, but it's kind of, uh, it's, it's confining. And so for, for LA, it's like, people come there, but you can just do anything you want to do. It's very, very open and there's nothing um, you can't, do in LA, and it seems to be more generous. Even the even the landscape, you might say, the space, it, it it's there for artists. And uh, New York is like confined, you know. And it's also it's 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 written in New York. It's everything is already established there. Yeah. So much, you know. There's no room. I mean, there's room for that kind of establishment, but LA doesn't have that. LA is just like an open place. Well, it's also a place that, where you have no expectation that something's going to last for 40 or 50 years, right? It's, mm -hmm. you, you That's expect, okay. You, ex, you know, it's dynamic in that sense that things are torn down and rebuilt. And it's also kind of low enough. It's like I used to teach at a graduate program at Bard in upstate New York. And, uh, and I would take my camera around. I would just go for a month in, uh, in the summer to, to teach. I'd take my camera and I couldn't photograph because there's all these damn trees, <laughs> in a way. And, and I used to title, like when I would le give lectures, I'd, I'd title them The Landscape and Things in the Way. You know, be, 
because the thing yeah. in Southern California, you have this deep horizon that you can deal with in, in relation to right. information in the foreground and, and play around. But in terms of, I find myself often in buildings. I, I work in abandoned spaces. Some of the things that have been rotating here, I've been the last three years, I've been photographing in a, in a in abandoned Air Force uh, kind of housing precinct. And, um, but what's interesting to me is that the, those interiors are, are uh, generic. You know, even, yeah. it, you know, the, a bathroom looks like a bathroom, unless you're rich, everybody's bathroom kind of looks the same. Everybody's front room kind of looks the same. I mean, these are kind of imprinted on my consciousness that the rooms I've lived in and the rooms I've been th th through. So there, there's something kind of generic and common and a, a kind of experiential ground on which I can sort of move into an act. And then it's specific, you know, we talked about the specific and abstract, you brought that up. You know, the, 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 thing, that's, the thing that interests me about photographs is, is, is that relationship between specificity and abstraction. So, you know, the illustration I often use is like, if you photograph a goat, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, if you paint a goat, it's a, an emblem of goatness, whatever you want that to be, the pastoral, <laughs> the evil, uh, cheese, whatever you want it to be. Uh, but if you photograph a goat, it's an emblem of goatness, but it's also just that particular goat on February 12th, 19 whatever, in the backyard with the sun, you know, there's a specificity to it. And photographs uh, are, are never, com are almost never completely abstract. They're always, there's always this kind of uh, inertia in terms of being drawn to the complete service of abstraction. They're always anchored in the specificity of their genesis. And it's this relationship between the specific and abstract that always interests me. So I'm always interested about, so a lot of times you'll see the longitude and latitude of, of a location or you'll see a time, the exact time that something's done. So I'm interested in this notion that it's an imprint of something specific, but then I'm also interested in how it operates symbolically or abstractly. And so that's the play back and forth there. I think it's in that, like looking at the isolated houses and you've got that you know, the GPS coordinates, and it is a completely unremarkable place that probably most people wouldn't really wanna, wouldn't really wanna go. Mm -hmm. And I think, and looking at, at the, um, your most recent pictures from the desert as well, I mean, these are, um, they are the, these are kind of, I think in some way, kind of anti-landscapes where, you know, we think about, um, you know, what California is supposed to look like, mm -hmm. and there are orange groves everywhere, and it's sunny, and we've got the beach, and it's almost like, you know, we kind of hit the coast and started doubling back and, you know, you both ended up out in the desert in um, these places that are very, um, I think it's fair to say, threatening. I mean, you've got the sense that there is something just outside the frame one way or the other. But what's, um, I was thinking, uh, looking at your pictures, and John, you've got, um, kind of abandoned um, at the Air Force Base, the abandoned housing, and you, the photographs you've been making recently, these are places that have been built and never occupied and have kind of come the failure, apart. The failure, of, you know, whatever happened, they went belly up. And you just find these places, um, and, you know, I would ask sometimes when I would photograph a place, and I'd say, well, how long has this been, been here? And some, you know, if I talk to people, they'd say, oh, this has been here 10 years. You know, somebody's tried to develop something, and never happened. So it's just been that way for 10 years, you know. I just photographed it and left. Yeah, so it's like, and this is places out in the middle of nowhere. You know, if you're going to try to build a housing development, it's not near anything, you know. And maybe it was really, really cheap to buy the land, but, you know, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, yeah. But I, for me, it was the experience of going to these remote places I'd never been to, to find, to see what's there, to discover something. That was the kind of the, the pleasure, you might say. And for as um, kind of unpleasant or as threatening as some of these places can be, I and mean, both of your work has this almost sort of luminous glow to it. And do you? Yeah, you know, I never think of them as threatening. It, uh, I don't, I don't either. Yeah, when, when I was a kid, actually, I lived in the extreme west in the San Fernando Valley, it was very rural, and they had a, uh, an abandoned movie ranch. 
and I used to sneak around in the band and movie ranch when I was a kid. So my whole life, I sort of loved a band. There, there's one. That's the Air Force Base. Um, there's our eight by ten negatives, uh, black and white negatives. Um, so, yeah, but the desert is the, the desert is just, you know, the desert's always defined by absence, right? How do you define it? Well, there's no water, there's no trees, it's, you know. But that, but it's not empty, right? It's there's, it, but it's it, it's it's sort of vacant enough that it gives a certain kind of existential buzz to what is there, right? It, it's 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 this kind of relationship of absence in relation to what is present gives things a, a kind of hum, an existential hum that, that I find really interesting. The, the isolated houses actually came out of a body of work that were, was about uh, existen existential des desires. I did a body of work of, uh, called Four Landscapes that were all black and white photographs and there were mountains, desert, city, sea in Southern California and in each was uh, in evidence of somebody's desire to be outside of culture. So, and the, the one section was you know, so many little people wandering off in the distance. One section was isolated houses in the desert. One section was stray dogs in the city. And one section was little boats out at sea. And then I went back to photograph the houses in color just because when I was doing it in black and white, I just got seduced by just the quality of them. But it, it's the kind of ironic desire to be, be outside. You know, so you like move into nature and you build this thing. And, and the line just moves in front of you, right? You never can get outside, but it's sort of driven by this existential desire. And I mean, that's what originally drew me to it. It's, it. And then the dogs that are showing up there, just when I was out photographing the houses, dogs would chase my car. So I did a whole body of work of dogs <laughs> chasing my car. Well, I'm gonna ask um, a final question before we kind of open things up. Um, if any of you would like to ask Anthony or John something, and I, I fear that I'm gonna get a giant eye roll or worse for this. But um, I was reading the, uh, Anthony, your interview with Lewis Baltz, and Lewis said, I always believed God would destroy LA for its sins. Finally, I realized he had already destroyed it and he left it around as a warning. <laughs> um, do you think it's important um, for photography to have, or for art to have, a kind of moral voice? Well, let me put it another way. Um, maybe this is not a, a directly responding to that notion. Um, um, whatever I'm photographing, it, it, it may be, seem grim, but you have to love that, what you're looking at. And that's the only way I can try to say that's what I do. And that's what I'd like to continue doing. And uh, that's a difficult thing, like saying, yeah, if you're, yeah you're, out, you're in the desert, you don't think of it as, as grim, John doesn't either. But a lot of people would say, oh, those are really grim places. And how, do, how do you do it? And you know, how do you photograph these homeless sites? And if you thought about it, you wouldn't do it. You know, you don't think about it. You just you want to make that work, and so you have to embrace that. If that if that's the only way I can try to talk about my own work, if that means there's a, um, a feeling of uh, it's serious and it's, uh, it's what you do. Uh, why you're drawn to that particular kind of, for me, that whatever that subject is, uh, I can't put my finger why I'm drawn to certain things. Well, it's a, a really complicated question. Uh, dude, and Lewis actually did believe that. I, and I never actually think I agreed with him. I think he, he found, I mean, he always talked about things in relation to a kind of vulgarity yeah. of the, the built environment, but I never really thought his work was really doing that. And so, I mean, these are always very complicated questions. It, it, like I did a body of work at the LA airport where they had did an eminent domain uh, this is in the mid '70s, and they, and they, you know, they, they, because they moved runways out to the airport, the sound was, you know, level was going to be too high, and so they 
they forced the people out of those houses. And I, I photographed where people broke in, I for, forced entries. And always the question t was like, was I making a statement about the eminent domain and the injustice of right. moving those people out? But, you know, I fly in and out of that airport. It, it, it's like, you know, you know you be, people build little cracker box houses, but, you know, their standard of living is much better than people's standard of living was 100 years ago. So, so it's not so easy to make a kind of moralistic, uh, you know, and, and there is a real movement of that in terms of curators sort of evaluating works by the virtue of their intentions, mm -hmm. which I always think is problematic. I, it becomes, they become the kind of new clergy right. and, and gatekeepers of like deciding what is, you know, and it's always, you know, so I, I think, you know, the best I can do is, 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 is to encourage or embrace a kind of directness of experience of the world, a kind of a heightened uh, and hopefully clear uh, engagement with, with looking and knowing and, and, I, and those kinds of broad judgments about yeah. this is a good or bad thing is way beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Would anybody like to ask either of us, but hopefully either of them a question? What kind of equipment do you, I'm sorry. What, what kind of equipment do you use? <laughs> uh, I use everything. I, the, the, that, that's a 35 millimeter. The one before was a gigapan. Uh, so the gigapan is like a, a, a the guys that developed the Mars rover came. So upstairs, there is this big photograph of me running from the camera, and this it's like nine feet long, and it's a digital camera on a robotic camera base. So that's made up of like 90 photographs. It's kind of photographed over about 15 minute uh, period of time, the camera scanning the landscape. And then the, all of those files are, are uh, are brought into the computer and tiled together into one big seamless photograph that's kind of a temporal scan over time. Lately, I've been shooting with an 8x10 view camera and a 4x5 view camera and making contact prints. Like the, the isolated houses are medium format color negatives. Uh, I, I actually, just about everything. I think I do just about every format in one way or another. I, yeah, I, I shoot film and use three or four different cameras, different lenses. So it's all, nothing digitally shot, I mean. That answers your question. I'm curious, uh, do the two of you know each other? Have you known each other for some time and in what context? Uh, well, we're both from LA. <laughs> yeah, we're so old, I'm sure neither one of us remember the first time we met. Yeah. I, I don't, but we yeah. certainly run into one. We don't hang out together. Well, we, so. have, done, uh, we have done another talk together in the 80s. Huh? Good question. <laughs> I don't think it was that long ago. Oh, was anyway, anyway, we know each other, yes. yes. Any other questions? Yeah, somebody up there. Oh, yeah. Gotta get this exercise. Um, it's, it's sort of a question for, for both of you, um, even though you seem to approach it very differently. But so the the idea that, that in bless you, <laughs> the idea in in um, in Los Angeles or in or in the movie industry that the, the, there's like a, in, an interior space that's constantly transitioning. It can be anything, you know, and then the, the idea that outside that it's constantly, like, that, I like that line, the hard look, but it's, it's, it's this is going to be, this is how it is, and, but it, it could very easily change at any moment. Like, does that affect your, um, well, how do, does, that, does that affect the, the movie industry and how things are constructed? Did that affect um, either of you in a way? 
you mean in LA, uh, the, the, the environment of uh, LA being a movie place? Yeah, yeah but, but the idea that like, you know, growing up and seeing an, a Western town, <laughs> And, and it wasn't a real Western town, but it's kind of any Western town, you know, and then saying, if that was always in the best, like Mr. Devola, and if that was always in the back of your head, like when you were thinking, or did it just occur to you later, like, oh God, that, that Western town, you know? Um, I, I don't know how to answer it, because in the movie industry, uh, I never thought about, um, it never affected my life. I mean, I knew some people that, as photographers, would make a had a living doing stills for movies. I mean, I mean, as a living, but I never did that. I mean, in terms of uh, using photography, so I have no experience with Hollywood or, you know. No. I, I've done several bodies of work that dealt with it specifically. I did a body of work in the late '70s, photographing the old MGM uh, New York City sets in Culver City. I also did uh, the last season of the X-Files. I photographed on the sets, on the sound stages of the sets of, of the X-Files. Uh, and I've collected old Hollywood, primarily uh, continuity photographs. I have a book called Continuity. And I, I do kind of arrangements of uh, appropriated 1930s continuity photographs. And as I said, as a kid, I used to run around on the lots. Um, so I've done a lot of work explicitly about it. I'm not sure it informs directly my other artwork. I mean, I think about, I think about, you know, I think about photography, you know, it's like, it's hard for us to imagine, you know, the effect Photography has unconsciousness, and film is is a is a you know uh, an aspect of that. You know, if if I if I think about Los Angeles, I I have a mental image of this place, and of, I've lived there my whole life. I've driven all over it continuously, but I've also seen hundreds of thousands of uh, images of Los Angeles, photographic images. I've seen hours and hours and hours and hours of films where photography is, uh, you know, it's represented as, as the ground on which action happens. And what interests me is that we no longer even question our visual, our, our, our internal sense of a place, what of it is from direct experience and what of it is from mediated experience. That it be, especially as it recedes in, in, in uh, in, in time from, from, from when we've experienced it, it doesn't even occur to us to ask that question. We just have a sense of what it is, and it's a tapestry of direct experience and mediated. In some cases, we've never been there, and we have a sense of the place. And, uh, and Hollywood's a big part of that, of the film industry, but just photography in general, just the idea of photographs, or our personal history. You know, what you think of, like, when you, th when you think of your childhood, like w what portion of that is from looking at photographs of your childhood as opposed to actual memories? That, so I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm really into photography. I mean, I think, I think it is, you know, just that uh, it has uh, just this fundamental effect on human consciousness. And I think this digital transition we're in is having an equally profound effect on the fundamental nature of consciousness. I thank both of you for all your photos. They are very enjoyable to watch. My questions are for both of you. It's hard to tell on many photos if it's during the day, midday, late day. Do you prefer morning photos to evening photos, and why? I'm, I'm not sure I got that question. What can you Do you have a, a, a favorite time to photograph? Oh. <laughs> Morning, late, night. Oh. Well, the, the place I've been photographing, I have to sneak in now, so I sneak in early in the morning. And <laughs> That's your favorite time, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I like the right as the sun's just coming up for what I'm doing right now. Isolated house I shot late in the afternoon. Yeah. I mean, you know, photographers generally like that kind of 
lower angle light, you know, call it the magic hour, going back to film. Right. You know, when the, and especially in LA, the, most of the year, the, 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 it's pretty, you, you like hard light, so there right. you can go and shoot in the middle of the day. I, yeah. I have a hard time. M middle of the day, I've, I've shot a lot of my pictures in the middle of the day, but I'm trying to vary it now. Put that way. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask a question about a statement. Um, I believe you both said something along the lines of New York was being heavily photographed and so it didn't seem like a place that you wanted to go to do work. Um, nowadays in a world that's being constantly photographed, um, even like places around here in Lincoln, which could be considered a small town, it's being heavily photographed. Um, I'm just interested in kind of hearing your take on how you go about finding your unique landscapes in a world that's now more heavily photographed. There, there's uh, this guy that made up all these words and it's called the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. And one of the words is about, I can't remember what the word is, but it's about making an incredible photograph with the realization that there's a million photographs just like it. And, and that is a problem. That is absolutely a problem. And, and uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, if, if I were starting out now, I think I would not maybe go about it in a very different way. You know, I think the internet's like really, really interesting. I might be interested in harvesting imagery uh, and, and sort of dealing with this kind of flood, you know, I don't know, Jung talked about the collective unconscious, right? Yeah, and, you know, but maybe, you know, instead of that being some kind of biological thing, that's what we're doing. We're sort of manifesting this kind of, this flood of billions of imagery, this, this kind of collective unconscious. And I think you could make images out of that. But, you know, I, I try to figure out a process that's my own. But. Well, let's just put it this way. It's uh, if you think about a place being um, uh, heavily photographed, um, then that would be the challenge. In other words, if you wanted to go and photograph again now, whether it's New York, Las Vegas, wherever, and you wanted to go there, then that's the challenge. Uh, all these pictures have been made, but it's, it's not really then uh, a photography. What you're really talking about is what you do with photography. In other words, somebody will come along and photograph again in New York or Vegas, or wherever, and make some pictures that will surprise you. And that's, that's the challenge. And it's open to anybody, I think. I was going to kind of not um, get into the whole photography in the 20th versus 21st century or digital film kind of argument. But I, just thinking about this, I mean, I'm going to throw this out there that in a certain way I think that, um, and you can tell I'm right at that point in my life where I'm starting to scream, get off my lawn at, at everybody. Um, <laughs> that in a certain way, photography has begun to mean less than it, it used to. And I'm thinking there's a uh, landscape photographer and he was talking about coming back from his recent trip and he'd spent a week and he just, you know, discovered a new subject that it turns out has been photographed for the past hundred years. And he said, I made 22,500 captures this week. And as a curator, I have absolutely no interest in looking at any of them. Um, I mean, do you think that, I mean, and you're both shooting film, and I know you're both printing digitally sometimes. I remember the last time I saw you, you the first thing you said, let's go in the studio, and you had a, a box of silver prints. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, that the way digital has made photography, I don't know if we want to say that's easier, or, or I think in a certain way it's made it sort of cheaper because you're not thinking about the cost of that sheet of film or the labor that goes on. I mean, you couldn't shoot 22,000 sheets of 8 by 10 film. Yeah, right. Well, I, no, I, um, even black and white um, and color later, I, I, I didn't shoot that much film. I never have and still don't. Um, and I'm, I'm happy about that. But I have um, met a few people, other photographers, that yes, I've heard that There's, they're, they've shot thousands of these pictures and when I hear that I'm thinking uh, what do you do with that you know? yeah 
You know, so, I mean, it's almost an embarrassment if I, if I turned around next year and told you I just shot a thousand pictures, you know, of something or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that still. I'm still shooting film in, in a very, um, uh, the same way. It's kind of, kind of like, it, in other words, you see, you see something, you want to take a picture of it, and then you, you don't take a picture. So, I, I mean, I do that. I go and I say, oh, I don't take a picture. It's not take a picture, take a picture. There was somebody, I won't na name his name, but uh, who, who I knew years ago, I haven't seen him in years. He said um, he was going through the motion of putting film through a camera, meaning he didn't know what he was doing, but he, was, he thought he, that would be doing something, just putting film through a camera, shooting a lot of film, that maybe somehow he would get something. And I have uh, had experiences with a few other people who didn't know what they were doing, but they were just out of desperation. Uh, instead of stopping, saying, "I don't know what to photograph," "I don't know how to make a picture now," or whatever, they try to put film through a camera, do different things, and that's uh, just kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I heard the the guy that was uh, Barack Obama's uh, photographer say he shot a million images. But, you know, it just places the emphasis on um, selection, yeah. right? It, it, it's like, you know, you can take a drone with a video camera and fly through some circumstance and you might have thousands of captures and then it becomes, it becomes about editing. It, it becomes much more the emphasis than the initial selection. It just moves, yeah. it just moves. The, the criteria yeah, yeah. In, a, in a way. So I, I don't think that it's, that the fact that you can shoot abundant numbers of images diminishes the possibility of doing something interesting. I, think, I just think it requires uh, different emphasis and procedures. I mean, I'm shooting a lot of film currently because I'm working with an abandoned military base and there's just something about it being a kind of indust a, a literal industrial artifact, its indexicality and its materiality that fits with that subject for me. But I, I don't have any problem with being promiscuous <laughs> digitally, you know. And, and uh, you know, it just requires a different attitude. You know, and I'm not sure I know what to do with it. <laughs> I actually just bought a really nice digital camera for the first time. I mean, a, a, like a medium format kind of digital camera. And I'm trying, still trying to figure out what to do with the thing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't bemoan, you know. Well, look changing. at Gary Winogrand. He shot a lot of film, but he wasn't, he wasn't a very good editor of his own work. You know, um, that gives you an idea. And I think... Uh, um, I'm a pretty good editor of my own work. One more? Thank you both for being here. Mr. Davola and Mr. Hernandez, I have a question for each of you. Mr. Davola, I held in my hand number 145 of your Green Notebook project, and I loved it at the time. I loved it because it stopped the present moment, the way Sartre stopped the present moment. I was wondering, a very mechanical question to that, I heard that you hand glued all those pages. I didn't, somebody in, in China did. In the 500 did. that you did, and I was wondering if you had done that. I did not. Uh, that was the Nasrelli Press uh, published that book, and uh, yeah, they just arrived in a box. I didn't hand glue. It was <laughs> seen a multimedia effort with somebody's photographs. No, I, I, I wish I could take it. I wish I could take credit for having done it, but no. I think somebody in China actually uh, glued all those pages and all those books. Well one forty five meant something to me. Thank well, I'm, you. I'm delighted that you liked it. And then Mr. Hernandez, I love your colors and your textures, particularly the photos for Rome and the Orlando pictures. I was wondering if you could speak to what motivates you and how do you pull that beautiful color and texture into each of your photos? Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, it's just something that 
you know, you just uh, embrace something. You know, I can't put my finger on what, I mean, it's, it's a subject, and then in whatever time you made a picture, it's whatever, um, you know, attracted you to it. But I, I can't put my finger on why, and that sense of um, color or whatever, uh, it, it's, it's an intuitive thing, you know, it's different for everybody, you know. Uh, all these pictures, that, in terms of the, the discarded, um, those are pictures I, whatever they were, at that moment, I made that picture, whether it was late in the afternoon or two in the afternoon, wherever that subject was, and uh, that's it. You know, it's not like um, I may have come back and photographed something else near it, but didn't try to rephotograph something I already photographed. So it's just, happening at the moment, you know. There are, there are some places I, in, the, in the past where I, you know, you might come and say, oh, uh, the light wasn't right, you're gonna come back. You didn't make a picture that time. You came back and then you photographed something for the first time even though you had been there before. I've done that, but I, I am really kind of specific about uh, not shooting a lot of film. And um, I, I just started off that way. You know, even when I started 35 millimeter, you could buy a roll of uh, 100 uh, roll of film. You had to roll it yourself, and I did, did that, and uh, because it was cheaper, you know. And later, when you had money, you could actually buy real film. You know, 35 millimeter black and white. That was a big treat, you know. And then color. Uh, I was very careful when I shot Rodeo Drive. If I shot a roll of film in a day, that was a big deal. You know, I didn't shoot a lot of film. You know, because like I said, even when you're 35 millimeter, you could stop, something happened, you, you don't take a picture. You know, and so that's just the way I, I grew up, so to speak, on photography. Uh, I didn't have a lot of money and, and was very careful. Yeah. Any yep. other questions? Someone right there. I um, just have a question about the Air Force uh, base uh, mm -hmm. photographs, and uh, I'm curious if uh, you were primarily drawn to those photo or that that place because of the kind of abandoned aesthetic, or if Quincy Jones's work actually informed your research, or if I'm correct, there it's the Quincy Jones, the architect. A Quincy Jones. Yeah. yeah. No, I didn't even know A Quincy Jones was the architect when I first started. Also, then, did um, did taking the photographs sponsor an interest in his work that would inform future work, or was it just a kind of happenstance um, it, situation? It was it was happenstance. Uh, the the George Air Force Base uh, George Air Force Base was in Victorville, California, and it was uh, sort of World War II kind of commissioned to World War II, and then they sort of re, they, they hired this architect, A. Quincy Jones, to build the housing precinct, which is quite large, like it's a golf course and a hospital. And, and in 92, they uh, abandoned the base. And it's, uh, it's just been sitting out there in, in the desert ever since. And uh, there are kind of slight modernist notes, but it's not really sort of exceptional modernist architecture. It's, it's pretty uh, generic in, in terms of uh, the, uh, certainly the interiors are, are pretty generic in, in, the, in, that, in that sense. So wh when, I was a, when I was a teenager, I read this uh, science fiction book and it was about a planet that was solid, built all the way around and had been abandoned many, many centuries ago and every, all the great minds of this, of this, uh, of this future uh, science fiction uh, uh, world were, were ar archaeologists and they would be digging into this planet trying to figure out what the past was. And uh, this place is that for me. It's like this, this kind of crust of built, abandoned meant that I can kind of work with in different kinds of ways. Uh, the rub in the book was that they find out that it, it, it was fake, <laughs> and, and that it was just a way to occupy uh, those people and uh, keep them from 
more uh, relevant political activity, uh, which so gets back to your political question. And it's like, uh, with the, what's the Magister Ludi the Glass Beat game? Same thing, you know, it's like, yeah. but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, John. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.